But I think most Protestants today, reflecting upon that, would say, if it doesn't line up with Scripture, the Scripture is my litmus test. So mm -hmm. I can take from Augustine when he's in line with Scripture, but I can reject him when he's not. So they would have a more humble, balanced approach. Yeah, it, which I, I like that you call it a humble and balanced approach because that it is. But w the first thing to recognize is that these guys are doing scriptural work, meaning none of them are saying, hey, I believe these things about baptism because I've ignored Scripture. I don't care what Scripture has to say. I see. They're unpacking Scripture. They're saying, hey, in Ezekiel, when God promises to take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh by the sprinkling of water upon you, what's that about? And they're saying it's about baptism. Or in 1 Peter 3.21, when it says baptism now saves you, does that mean baptism saves you or does it mean some other thing? <laughs> they're like, no, no, it means baptism saves you. Like they're, they're unpacking scripture. So the difference isn't, oh, the Protestant is just following scripture and we're following the church fathers. The difference is the Protestant is following their reading of scripture and we're following the reading of scripture from those who learned the scriptural message from apostles. And so they, the reason I'm looking so early on and really putting that rough stop at about 200 is because you are at that point dealing with people who got Christianity either from the apostles or from those who got it from the apostles. So really concretely, uh, the apostle John dies about the year 100. He's got two disciples we know of. St. Ignatius of Antioch, and St. Polycarp of Smyrna. Polycarp, we know he was born in the year 69. We know he died in the year 155 because in before a year has passed from his martyrdom, there's an account of his martyrdom written up by those who witnessed it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best attested second century Christian texts because to commemorate a thing that happened in 155, they write about it in 156. Mm -hmm. We're not looking back on it 20, 50, 100 years later, <clears throat> under a year later. Uh, they're talking about his witness as he's going to be martyred. And in that witness, he mentions having followed Christ for 86 years. And so scholars say, well, he was either born 86 years before that, or he was born even longer than that and is, you know, but yeah. converted as a young kid or something. So taking the more conservative of those two, that's a birth in the year 69, death the year 155. He is the one who teaches St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who writes the biggest, like, text of the second century against heresies. And so when we, for instance, when the Protestant says, I'm just going to follow the Bible, it's like, well, how do you know which books are in that Bible? How do we even know like which gospels are in that Bible? Well, the first person to attest to that is St. Irenaeus, this student of Polycarp, this is a student of John's. And he's the first one to give us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we trust it because he's so close mm -hmm. that we know error hasn't crept in. But it's on that same ground that we also trust that he's not getting baptism wrong because he also learned about that. And we trust that he's not getting the Eucharist wrong because presumably the apostles and the saints who followed them didn't just say, here's the Bible, you know, see ya. Yeah. They were there to actually answer those kind of questions. So specifically when we have these issues that everyone believes and believes that they got from the apostles where they're not just doing their own private exegesis, but are actually saying, uh, we've received this. That's a strong indication that it's not just my interpretation versus yours or, uh, you know, a, a Protestant versus a Catholic interpretation. It really is. What did the apostles teach about what scripture meant compared to what might I just get if I was doing it, uh, in an uneducated kind of blind sort of way. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So baptism, Eucharist, sacrifice of the Mass in particular. What else? It sounded like you had oh, yeah, four, yeah. Sorry. four that you came up with? Yeah, or? the fourth one is the four Gospels. So I already alluded to that one. The third one is the structure of the church. What did the churches look like yeah. in the early church? Because you'll often hear this idea that early Christianity was really chaotic and that sometime in the second century, mm -hmm. the so-called mono-episcopacy arises. Yeah. Mono-episcopacy just means one bishop per diocese, one bishop per church. Uh, and when you go back and read the earliest writings, they're actually really clear. Like, no, no. Yeah. You have to have a bishop, yeah. presbyter, as we now say priests, and deacons. And if you don't, you just don't have the church. You can have believers, but you don't have the church in the sense the earliest Christians understood that term. So the presuppositions, like Catholics and Protestants usually uh, think of something very different when we use words like church. I'm saying, okay, let's check those. What did the earliest Christians mean by church? How did they understand it? And you go yeah. back and read people like Ignatius of Antioch, yeah. and there's no doubt, there's no question. And uh, so much so that John Calvin actually suggested that Ignatius's writings were forgeries. So he thought Catholics had just That's invented right. them. 
And it was the work of Protestant scholars in the 19th century. That was really, it his letter to the Smyrnans where he said, where the bishop is, there is the church? He, he says that over and over again. But yeah. yes, he, he says that. Uh, letter to the Smyrnians in uh, chapter 7, he also talks about the Gnostics denying the real presence of Christ and That's therefore right. incurring damnation That's right. and that we can have nothing to do with them. He's not trying to argue, hey, you know, you guys should really start taking that John 6 stuff, literally. <laughs> He's saying, here are these people who deny the incarnation. And, then, and we can't have communion with them because since they deny the incarnation, right. they also deny the real presence. That's right. He's using it as a litmus test, and he's assuming his readers get all of that. Mm. And you get that later. Uh, I believe it's Irenaeus who says, our opinion is in accord with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist is in accord with our opinion. That this notion of using um, the Eucharist as a proof that the incarnation was real, Mm -hmm. Which is totally backwards from a modern way of thinking. Yeah. Because now we've got a lot of Christians who believe in the incarnation and deny the real presence. Those right. people didn't exist in the Whereas first and Ignatius second century. Is saying the real presence is true, and therefore it follows that there was an incarnation. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the the argument just works totally upside down from how we would expect it. Yeah. He's taking as a given the thing we now dispute, and using it to prove the thing we now take as a given. Wow. Could an Orthodox read that book and be like, yeah, 100%, or are there, does it get into areas um, where they might... I, I point towards, in the bit about bishops, we get into Irenaeus in Apostolic Succession, mm -hmm. and he talks about the role of the Bishop of Rome, and that it's, it's necessary that other churches are in agreement with this church. Mm. And so you get the, the first kind of clear papal claim, one of the first clear papal claims there. So I think other than a couple pages, an Orthodox person would be like, yeah. yeah, right on. And then they get to those pages and be like, yeah, he didn't mean it. And then skip past and, mm -hmm. and go on to the next bit. One thing, one of the things I love about Jimmy Aiken is that he doesn't make an argument unless he can really show it to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, when it comes to intercession of the saints, mm -hmm. like there was some doctrinal development yeah. there. And so I love that that's not one of your things yeah. there. Like yeah. I like that you're sticking with here's what there's actually really no disagreement on. I wanted to just take <clears throat> I wanted to take the low-hanging fruit. I want to take the easy stuff. Yeah. Because the ordinary evangelical Protestant isn't just disputing something like, can we call Mary Theotokos? Can we call her the mother of God? They're That's disputing right. stuff that like nobody disagreed about. I, or nobody remotely Christian disagreed about in the yeah. early church. Yeah. Everett Ferguson uh, has a, a work on baptism where he looks at the first 500 years and he points that there's, and he's a Protestant scholar saying, everyone's in agreement on what baptism does. That's right. And they're using the same scriptural motifs and everything else, which which points to this idea. This is not just some extra scriptural tradition. This is the apostolic understanding mm -hmm. of how scripture works. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment below letting us know what you thought about the video.